Um, so I'd like to say a very warm welcome to everyone for, com for coming to this session on Transnational Modern Languages, a handbook, and to thank my colleague, Cathy Collins, for arranging everything. This is the Institute's first strategic event of this academic year. A handbook is very definitely making an intervention. It is strategic in that it's thinking about the nature of the disciplinary field, the models that have obtained in the past, and those that as a subject community we may wish to promote in the future. It is thinking about the nature of research, but also very clearly about the interface between teaching and research. It is reflecting deeply about what we might mean when we talk, as we increasingly do, about the integrated study of language, culture and society. I'd also like to say a warm thank you to those of our colleagues who have shared their views on the book via the video commentaries. And I think that's a really great way of starting the debate about the book and its many dimensions. And it's very much in the spirit of a conversation that today is organised. After the initial response, the editors, Professor Jenny Burns from Warwick and Professor Derek Duncan from St Andrews, will say a few words. Then what we really want to do is open the floor to everyone to make a comment, a reflection, or a very basic question about the nature of the book and how it can be used. The hope is that this will be a very informal session, insofar, of course, as the online format permits that. So it just remains for me to say what an enormous pleasure it is to welcome Professor Mary Louise Pratt from the Department of Spanish and Portuguese stroke social and cultural analysis at NYU. It is no exaggeration to say that her work has redefined understandings of cultural and linguistic interaction. Her concept of the contact zone that she explores with such depth and analytical power in her work, Imperial Eyes, Travel Writing and Transculturation, is of fundamental importance to anyone working in the field of post-colonial and transcultural study. Her most recent collection of essays, which we'll show a, uh, uh, the cover of, her most recent collection of uh, essays, Planetary Longings, argues that the last decades that we have lived through represent a turning point in the human and planetary condition. The work interrogates the forces of modernity, neoliberalism, coloniality, indigeneity, to examine the global crisis of futurity, which we are, of course, living through. Needless to say, this is a text that is addressing themes of the very utmost importance. So, to today's workshop, let's begin then the conversation about a handbook with Mary Louise's critical response. Thank you. All right, I'll start. Good morning, everyone. It's from New York. It's nine o'clock here, so I am still drinking coffee. I'm very happy to be with you today to celebrate the um, publication of uh, Transnational Modern Languages, a handbook. When Derek uh, first approached me with the title, Transnational Modern Languages, I actually assumed this was a collection about transnational approaches to language and to languaging, which is a topic I have been fascinated with for a long time. On opening it though, I saw that it was about the academic field of modern languages institutionalized as the study of the major modern versus classical European languages their literatures and cultures. As it happens, I know something about that too. My academic career began with an honors degree in modern languages and literatures at the University of Toronto in 1970. And 30 or so years later, I found myself president of the Modern Language Association of America based in New York. I think it's fair to say that this book sets out to revitalize this institutionalized field with an array of optics that both bring new objects of study into view and ignite new insights about existing ones. 
Such periodic revitalizing is, to channel Barack Obama, what we do in academia. The very introduction of modern languages into universities in the late 19th century was itself a huge and consequential innovation. In US universities, the study of American literature uh, did not begin until the 1920s. And in, uh, in, uh, even in comparative, in, uh, in, in the Modern Language and Literature's curriculum in Toronto in 1970, there were only token, co token courses on UK, US and Canadian literature, while the degree required reading the entire canon in three European literatures. Even in comparative literature, we were not taught to quote, to quote the introduction, we were not taught to um, write and think critically across linguistic and cultural borders. We did though read at least three medieval literatures in their original language languages. For some reason, my grammar of old English has stayed with me for my entire life. Some of you may recognize this book. I've been thinking lately, especially in planetary longings, about what I call the millennial pivot. The perception that the turn of the millennium marked an epochal change in the human and planetary condition. This, the pivot is marked in our discourse by things like the shift from the global to the planetary and from the paradise of the post prefix to the crisis of futurity um, in the face of climate catastrophe and radical uncertainty about everything, except that nothing like this has happened before, of that we are certain. This collection seems to me to kind of straddle that pivot. A good deal of its thinking across languages and cultures follows the mobile circuitry of globalization that culminated in the 1990s, notably migration and the communications revolution, introducing dramatic degrees of porosity into existing languages, cultures, and societies. Um, quite a few essays in the volume are tied to the empowerment of minorities as traditional exclusions tumbled in the face of both free trade and democratic ideals. While the post-World War II concept of world, as in World Bank and World Trade Organization, rested on the nation state order, neoliberalism brought the shift from world to the global, which, is, which was multinational and antinational. In language and culture studies, our turn to transnational work both participated in that shift and critiqued its ruthless immorality. This book registers the big successes of our methodological revolutions in the 1980s and 90s, where you really can talk about discoveries and advances in knowledge making, in the study of sexuality, empire and coloniality, performance, sound, food, borders, translations, the whole edifice of cultural studies. We are reminded in this context that capitalism itself has an incredible power to enliven, renew, and re-enchant the world, to inspire creativity, generate agency, stories, images, art forms, materials, poetics. It's probably important to remember as we work to revitalize the humanities in our universities in the 21st century, that the humanities played a central role in establishing and maintaining those boundaries, barriers and hierarchies of difference that the authors here seek to trespass or dissolve. That was in fact their job in the nation-based capitalist Euro-imperial order that also emerged in the late 19th century. So in that framework, we could see this book as engaged in the work of decolonization, the undoing of that order, 
and its dense, seductive, endlessly regenerative meaning machines, the making of new orderings that we find more lively, more real, more joyous, and more just. That's where the world making is going on. And it's not about making worlds with no borders and no differences at all, although some occasionally want to see it that way. So on the other side of the millennial pivot, what kind of knowledge making does the new millennium call for? In Isiair Boyain's film, Tambien la Lluvia, Even the Rain, which appeared in Spain in 2010, a Spanish film crew is in Cochabamba, Bolivia, making a film about 16th century Spanish colonialism, when their work is interrupted by a popular revolt against the privatization of Cochabamba's water system. These are events that really occurred in the year 2000. The, the chagrin director of the film says to his videographer, esto no tiene nada que ver conmigo, this has nothing to do with me. Si, sí, she replies, pero estás aquí. Yes, but you are here. Estás aquí, you are here. I think the era of planetarity requires us to join our thinking about mobility and fluidity with a deep and fully felt sense of place and placidness. Estás aquí. Every example in this book of operations across languages and cultures, ex every example examined happens in a place. The novel Mean, which the, with which the introduction opens, for example, is about mobility, fluidity, multilingualism, etc. but it is also deeply and particularly about Los Angeles. I'm very excited by, by the prospect of us language and culture scholars developing in ourselves and our students the ability and the need to be all aware always of where one is, who one is there, what responsibilities one has, what possibilities one has, what one is accountable for, and of the placidness of others, mobile and fluid as they may seem. As embodied beings, humans are always of necessity someplace, impacting their surroundings, engaged with them, uh, consuming resources. They are always environmental, linguistic, social, and cultural actors in place. Perhaps the concept of citizenship is useful here. 21st century planetary citizenship. Creating citizens is one of the mandates our disciplines have typically claimed for themselves. So I'm imagining a citizen equipped to operate across languages and cultures, as the, which is the aspiration here, and at the same time equipped to know and inhabit placidness, their own and that of others, to know what it means to be here. Indigenous thinkers from Hawaii to Amazonia to Nunavut have been trying to teach us this in a stream of ambitious extroverted scholarship that began at the turn of the millennium. It's also part of the pivot. A number of essays in the book take up placidness. Alongside migration, there are essays on home. There's an essay on home. Several authors cultivate a geographic imagination through essays on islands, rivers, oceans, as well as essays on animals, ecology, and liveness, which I loved. It is, easy to, it is easy to imagine nearly all the essays here working well in classrooms to start conversations about how to think about X or how to think about thinking about X. They will have to be used critically. Few of them point out limitations or complicities of their title terms or imagine the, their usefulness running out at some point. I'm guessing the editors agonized mightily, for example, about the terms transnational and modern in the title. In Planetary Longings, I often evoke the theory of the concept set forth in 2004 
by the Australian philosopher Elizabeth Gross in her book, Becoming Undone, and specifically in a chapter tellingly titled, The Futures of Feminist Theory, Dreams of New Knowledges. That's a post-pivot title, if there ever was one. Concepts, Gross says, are always related to problems without which they would have no meaning. Concepts don't solve problems, however. Rather, they enable the search for solutions by opening up alternatives to the present. They do this in the sphere of the imagination by, and I quote, transforming the givenness of chaos into various forms of order, into possibilities of being otherwise. Possibilities of being otherwise. The work of concepts is to, quote, enable us to think our way in a world of forces that we do not control. I read Gross's futurological reformulation as a reorienting toward the crisis of futurity and radical uncertainty that lie before us. Making concepts that do this work well for us is critical, the more so because the solutions to big problems always lie, Gross says, quote, beyond the horizon of the given real. This is the work of imagination. At the same time, and th with this I will end, Gross underscores that concepts don't bring new futures into being. Quoting, the alternatives to present domination, she says, are not there waiting to be chosen, possible but not yet real. These alternatives are not alternatives, not possibilities, until they are brought into existence. Only if the present presents itself as fractured, cracked by the interventions of the past and the promise of the future, can the new be invented, welcomed, and affirmed. Whether our universities in the 21st century can become sites of such cracking or undergo it themselves is a question of enormous and urgent consequence. And the answer lies in part with us. Thank you very much. Well, thank you so much for that uh, extraordinarily rich uh, and profound um, discussion of the theme in so many perspectives that a handbook is addressing uh, and uh, a very clear attention to the, uh, the, the precise moment methodologically um, in which this um, text is appearing. But, um, and the attention to, to the global, the situatedness, the imaginative, um, which so many of the essays are concerned with. But I'm going to invite um, Derek and Kath and um, Jenny to, to say a couple of words before we open the, the floor to uh, interventions, both on the volume, what um, Mary Louise has said, and uh, any general questions that people will have. So Derek or Jenny. Um, Jenny, are you there? <laughs> <laughs> I am here, yes. <laughs> so like are you, it forest. turns out. <laughs> yeah, in the end, yeah. <laughs> no, it's okay, you go first, Eric, go on. Um, no, first of all, I would like to thank Mary Louise for joining us today and giving us, uh, from what I heard, I think I heard the last half of your talk, it's a wonderful, rich intervention and engagement with your own recent scholarship, which I, I think, you know, Jenny and I have found very thought-provoking and to some degree running in parallels with what we were trying to do to a different audience, a different readership and from a different place. And I think one of the things that um, I appreciated very much about planetary, long planetary longings was your own sense of place and from where you speak both geopolitically and historically and the layeredness, the, the sediment layeredness and the weight that we bring with us when we engage in scholarship in which we can engage in different conversations and through which we produce different bodies of knowledge, different objects of knowledge. Um, I don't really want to say very much just now, um, other than to say something maybe about the 
title and the question of the transnational optic, which very much uh, folds into your uh, one of your concluding points, Mary Louise, about the potential redundancy of terms like the transnational and the modern. I think one of the things that Jenny and I wanted to do really from the outset was to avoid and avoid in our contributors any tendency or any desire to define, to produce closed definitions. We wanted, we, we've got a random number of chapters, 37, that's, you know, that happened to be 37, that could have been 45, you know, just anything. Um, but we didn't want people to be working to a definition. We want them to be putting out an, an incomplete hypothesis, an essay in the old fashioned sense. And similarly with optic, there might have been a temptation to talk about transnational optics as though there might be 37 of them, rather than putting that out as more of a, a kind of abstract noun, a concept which we might work with, we might work towards, we might you know, resist and, and, and work against, but really to kind of engage in the scholarship which we think modern languages, modern linguists, to use a kind of controversial, well, not really a controversial term, an overused and underthought term possibly, uh, the kind of cultural engagement that we might hope to promote uh, across national boundaries, but still being aware of national boundaries, uh, aware of our own Eurocentricism without wishing to overcompensate for that and pretend to have knowledges about places and cultures which we actually don't have. Um, and really to be aware of our own silences, our own aporia, our own difficulties, our own locatedness and what the, the po both the possibilities that gives us, but also the limitations that that doesn't impose, but that occasions. Um, and I think what I would hope for from today, and you know, I'm delighted that so many people are participating so generously, is a conversation uh, around the issues which the book, the essays perhaps stimulate for us as, as teachers as much as anything else, and as students of our own culture, as well as diverse cultures and languages. Uh, maybe over to you, Jenny, on that point. Thank you. Thanks, Derek. And thank you very much, Mary Louise, for that really interesting um, response to the book and placing it yeah, alongside your own work, which, as Derek said, he and I have been very much engaged with recently. Um, you've given us a lot more to think about, I think, both in the book and today and what you've said, and particularly um, thinking as we're hoping to do today and have been a lot recently about the futures of the book and where it might go next and where parts of it, as you suggest, might get um, left behind in certain ways, but in ways we very much welcome. We, we want this to sort of be, be superseded by um, active and inventive and imaginative work in, in the discipline. Um, I don't really have a lot to add to what Derek has said and um, also the point of today is to hear from others who might be engaging with the book in different ways. But I think one comment I would add is that your work made me think differently about the handbook around the millennial pivot that you talked about today and particularly about the question of um, planetary thinking and of planetary subjects. Um, and that made me really as you can tell from the book and particularly the introduction, we spent a lot of time in the crafting of it, thinking about the students that we were primarily hoping to talk to and what they would be looking for, what they might not have seen before and not what they might want from, from working with languages and cultures and from this book. And I think your work pointed me to the fact that we probably are, I hope, and I believe actually from my own experience, working with the kind of the people who come after that pivot and who are who see themselves as planetary subjects in exactly the ways you describe and i think some of the the videos some of the video responses to the book already have pointed to this as well the kinds of agency and creativity as you said and imagination that that students want to bring to their to their study of languages which i think um I mean, we all in modern languages departments at the moment, I think, find ourselves struggling sometimes with understanding how um, students' investment in modern languages as a subject of study has changed. And yet, I think um, the work we did for the handbook and work such as yours, which is speaking to 
similar questions um, points to the fact that things have changed in very positive ways and that we're perhaps dealing with um, subjects who yeah, you talked about decolonization being a sort of underlying theme of all parts of the book and who, who work in a much more sort of decolonized and decolonizing way um, in, in modern languages and also with, in the other subjects with which they study modern languages, which I think is also crucial. So I hope we'll hear more of that today. Um, but yes, those possibilities of being otherwise that you mentioned just now, quoting Elizabeth Gross, I think are are what we're trying to embrace in the book and I hope what we're we're speaking to in the, the students who will be reading and working with it but um that's I think all I'd like to add and let's hear what others have to say now but thank you again thank you very much for that I mean there are so many things to pick up on this and um um, I'll just pause for a second if anyone would like to, to, to come in with a question or a comment. I mean, what I thought we might begin by talking about is some of the practicalities um, of how exactly the book might be used and people to sort of um, share their experiences or their thoughts. And um, there are a number of contributors to the volume uh, here. And we might just reflect about where a student um, would come to this and uh, how they would use the book or how a teacher would use the book. I mean, in some respects, thinking back to the whole series and the whole project, part of it was motivated by the idea of that working as, a, um, as an academic, of course, you know where to find resources, you, you, you put them together. Uh, and, and then when you actually come to teach, it can be quite difficult to find texts that, or that are in a format that is uh, ready to use, accessible um, at an early stage. And in some respects, it is a good thing to begin with talking about what kind of vocabulary um, one would like to um, investigate, use, uh, deploy from an early stage and on which one would build uh, in more specialist environments. But I wonder if we could think a little bit about um, how uh, we might actually use the use the text or how people have been thinking about the uses in their own teaching practice. So I'm going to ask Laura Dana, you probably anticipated I'm how, going to ask you, Laura Dana, because I, I know you've spoken about this. So, so how did I know let's, it, let's, it let's might talk be. a little bit about this. Yeah. No, um, I, I think, first of all, thanks again. Thank you to, to Mary Louise and thank you for, to everyone involved for the fantastic um, job of, of engaging with, um, with the handbook. Um, I think in, it, to, to start answering that question, I would like to restart from, uh, from what Mary Louise was saying about concepts um, and, and how far they can take us, but at the same time, you know, to, to paraphrase what James Clifford wrote once about what these terms, you know, how they fall apart, precisely, that, that, that falling apart. Um, one thing that came through um, also very strongly in the comments and the contributions when a couple of weeks ago, we had a similar event which was hosted here at Stony Brook and we had a number of, of colleagues, um, uh, including Rebecca Valkovitz and some, some others, and also engaging with the handbook, is that sense of multiplicity and diversity which is built inside the book itself. Uh, Derek was um, underlying the, the almost almost, not exactly, but almost random, the number, you know, 37, not a perfect number in, 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 or an obvious number in any way. But the other thing that a number of people have remarked upon um, over the past few months since we, we've started to get uh, reactions to, the hand, to a handbook is the fact that there are, for instance, um, some keywords which have multiple essays. And, and in my case, of course, the obvious example is the one on translation where I contributed an essay and, and there are two more um, by Zilka and by, and by Luca. And I think that multiplicity and diversity of voices is in itself indicative precisely of something that uh, rereading last night, those three essays on translation, one after the other, comes through very strongly. The, the shift 
towards ideas of process uh, when it comes to our methodologies, our conceptualizations, the concepts that we, we want to use and how we use them. But also that sense that in, in incompleteness and imperfection to an extent is where we find our, our real uh, locatedness, um, that, that the attempt is not the, to provide some kind of final word on anything, but rather openings and openings that are them, themselves open to critiques. So for me, one way to get into a handbook is precisely that, not to give students um, one particular essay um, as uh, a, a synthesis and, and a synthetic um, compendium of what they should know about any of those terms, but rather to invite um, any user of a handbook to find their own paths and to make their own, at times, also unexpected connections between that sense of placedness or locatedness that each of the essays brings um, from a specific perspective, from a specific um, academic position, um, and also from specific examples that take us to specific locations, but then opening that up to the way in which those examples speak to the experiences of our own students. I work, um, it was the case when I was in Cardiff, it was the case when I was in Warwick, it is perhaps even more the case now that I'm in Stony Brook. I work with incredibly, wonderfully and, and creatively diverse groups of students, and it's precisely in the way in which they connect um, what we do to their own histories and their own experiences that I find a route towards that joyousness and that richness that, that Mary Louise was talking about before. Um, so that's the invitation I would have to invite our own students to connect the essays among themselves, but also to connect them to their own stories. Yes, thank you, Laura. And I think that's something that comes across very much in the, in the video commentaries as well, is that, that this is a text that invites individual pathways, um, that it's, it's a mosaic, it's a, it's, a, it's a maze. And I think that, that's come across. I wonder if um, um, Mary Louise, Derek, or Jenny wants to come back on that. Yep, Mary Louise? Yes, yeah, sorry. I'll just say yes, I think it's um it, it's a really is a teaching book. Um it's also a book in which a, a scholar trying to grapple with a with a concept can open the book to get some kind of um, you know, stimulation to kind of start a reflection. But I really see it as working in a classroom. And I know I I think we're we're all concerned about teaching, right? I when I was putting when I was putting planetary longings together, I, I all I could think about was how to make essays that can be used in a classroom because I think the fee, there's an incredible urgency right now about teaching um, because our students are going to be acting in a reality that we don't know that's not ours. You know, it's they're going to be living incredible things, and all we can do is pass on the best of what we know. Um, to them and they're the ones who are going to have to create the tools for remaking the world or 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 ending the world and um so i i do feel there's a real urgency around teaching right now and i i love the fact that this is feels to me primarily like a teaching book yeah Derek, jenny i mean th th another question is and just how do you use it? I mean, just to, it will be interesting to talk through how a course would actually yeah, bring it in. Um, well, I think Derek can probably ask that very answer that very directly in a way that I can't. But if I can just come in first on one point that struck me, um, and it relates to your question, Charles, but it came out of also what Laura Dan and Mary Louise were saying was that I think. It was striking, as, as has become clear already, and as people who know the book know, they, we deliberately avoided, as we've said, defining concepts and avoided some of the major um, keywords that you might have expected to see in a volume of this kind. But I think Lisa Panford's comments in the video on what we did with race, i.e. not to have it in the, in the contents page, but to demonstrate that it's in every essay in, in different ways. I think that comment was very 
revealing, I think, particularly coming from somebody who sort of trains teachers as well as teaches. Um, I think she she asks at some point, I don't know if she's here and I apologize if I'm misquoting or gobbling, but she asks at some point about the term race, but why would it be a topic? Uh, why would it be a specific subject area in the first place? And why was she looking for it in that way? And that's, I hope that's the kind of impact that, that the essays have on, on students, but as Mary Louise just mentioned, on those of us who are looking into a new area and trying to navigate it and want some prompts. But that the idea of, of course, I'm not looking for a single definitive essay on a particular topic, but I'm going to, to seek it out in more sort of lateral ways through a number of different essays and approaches to um, sort of places of articulation of this concept that I might not have looked at before. Um, so that's skirting around your question, Charles. I'll let Derek answer it properly now. <laughs> Um, I won't answer it properly, I'll answer it on the basis of my own experience, very recent experience of using the book in class with a group of advanced um, learners in year one who come from an incredibly diverse set of linguistic cultural backgrounds. And for this semester we're focusing primarily on the chapters which have got a, a, a kind of language based um, title. What was really fascinating about the first class in which we looked at Claudia Peralta's intervention on bilingualism was the sense of uh, shock that the student ex students experienced in learning that there's a history to bilingualism, there's a history of bilingual education, there's a historical sense that speaking different languages can be dangerous to the state, and there was also a most kind of like moving really because Claudia's, the, the final part of Claudia's essay focuses on a language project in Idaho where um, primarily a first language English speakers are encouraged, teachers were encouraged to go into the homes of their, their students. So going into um, domestic environments which with, they, with which they were unfamiliar in order to understand the kind of cultural repertoires and portfolios of knowledge that students were actually bringing with them into classrooms and which were normally not taken into consideration. Um, my students who are diverse but privileged, so they're not diverse in that sense, were actually quite taken aback to think that students learned languages, people learned languages in very different situations and with very different sets of motives and not just for high level professional reasons or not, not just for uh, cosmopolitan, you know, as badges of their cosmopolitan identity. And they're also slightly terror struck that I like the teachers in, their, in Claudia's chapter might start going into their homes and investigating what they actually do in their private lives. But the point was really in this book that it took them in so many, in this chapter was that it took them in so many different directions. It took them into their homes, it took them into American history, it took them all sorts of different places. And not one of the students objected or raised a question about the fact that we were in an Italian classroom, you know, ostensibly investigating, you know, studying things Italian. They immediately saw the connectedness, both to themselves and to their object of study, their sensible object of study. And that seemed to me a, a source of, on the one hand, a source of great relief, but also really interesting as a prism through which I understood the perspectives that this group of students were actually bringing to their area of study. That for them, Italy and Italianness and the Italian language was not a, a kind of silo, it was not sectarianly divided from other languages, other cultures, but was precisely a platform, a mechanism for them to engage more broadly with the world. And although we've just started using the book, I'm very optimistic about the kind of places that the students will, uh, will be able to go with uh, the different contributions. Thank you, I think that- Charles, sorry, can, I, I, say, yeah, yeah, can sure, I just sure. say one, one thing to, to what Derek was just saying now, because I, I am now planning to take some of these essays into one of my classes because of um again because of the responses of students and 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 so what i am noticing so we we recently had a number of events uh, with the students in my classes here where they heard people artists 
researchers reflect on their own connection and the work they've done with their own and their family memory. And I'm now finding myself going through this uh, through a handbook and picking essays that I want my that I want students to to look through and to connect because of the response. So many of them have, have come back saying that they want to go and they want to speak to their families. They want to speak to their communities. So, for instance, I'm looking at Naomi Wells' essay on community here and thinking of these methodologies that have emerged so strongly. Um, as Jenny was saying, you know, in this renewal, this periodic rethinking, as Mary Louise was saying, of modern languages, such as ethnographic and, ethno and autoethnographic methodologies. And I found myself saying to students, you need to learn, you need to listen, and you need to be generous and be gentle when you then go home and you ask your grandmother or you ask your neighbor about their experiences. And again, it's about that question of the diversity of experiences that especially some of our more privileged um, um, students might not necessarily read in terms of the traumas that also hang in there. So I'm, I'm, you know, I think some of the essays will also help students to reflect on the difficulties, not just the openings, but the difficulties, emotional, ethical, that come with exploring those new uh, places. Thank you, Loredana. I think that this takes us to some, some very interesting ground. I'm going to ask a, a, a few people to contribute here in the sense that the, the text isn't a text that is in any way freestanding. It's a text that is connected to so many other texts. It wants, as has been said, but to be part of a, a, a moving, changing uh, landscape of texts that are very much thinking about uh, the interface between teaching and research. But yes, it is taking breaking down some of the distinctions, some of the very um, very rigid distinctions about delivering a lecture according to a particularly recognized canon and really trying to get out of that thinking and to involve um, uh, the person uh, and the situatedness of the person in, in, in every respect. But that comes with uh, a lot of uh, questions and difficulties and uh, sensitivities, absolutely. And I think it also sort of connects with the, the move that is present within the disciplinary community as a whole to move towards ethnography. And I wonder if Charles Forsdick or Naomi Wells um, might say something about that, uh, having jointly authored papers on this and indeed um, really thinking about this as a move that um, certainly expands necessarily uh, the subject community and takes us into that interdisciplinary um, space that um, Mary Louise was talking about. So, um, yeah, I wonder if we can, yeah, Naomi and Ch or Charles, you're both unmuted, thank you. Let's follow this. Uh, yeah. I'll let Naomi start. Um, yeah, I, I was just going to say, I think, well, I think it's across the volume is, and I think it's in your introduction, Derek and Jenny, is that, and this is where it's not about the definitions, and it's also not about listing methodologies, which some people might also think a handbook is, you know, these are the methodologies for this discipline, which is also sometimes what a handbook might be. And I think what you point at, and, and it goes back to what Mary Louise Pratt was saying about um, ways of making knowledge and that being in place and about the individual. And I think it does run through, I think it is showing how academic researchers within this broad field make knowledge. And I think that's something that comes through in the essays, not explicitly, you know, as I say, it's not, this is, you know, in some fields they would list, these are our methodologies. So it's not, you know, it, we are different. We, we maybe have slightly more opaque idea, but I think what really comes through is the different ways researchers in this field do make knowledge. And, and that is where, you know, some of us use, draw on ethnographic theory, not everyone does, others draw on other theories and approaches but I think what I really enjoy about the volume is that emphasis on not this is our these are our terms for our field these are our methodologies it's this is how we make knowledge and asking students you know maybe how do you make knowledge what and what new ways as well looking to the future so I think it is what I think is really valuable about the handbook is really I think maybe in modern languages we do have method we're a bit people are like what are your methods and it's because I run our research training on in the field it's something I have to think about a lot because I'm like oh what 
what is our research training? What are our methods? And it it requires quite a lot of reflection. And I think I don't think it is that we need to list them and come up with a very rigid list, but I think it is productive. And I will just say, I think Ellie Crabtree's on this conversation, who's a new fellow who's joined us, who is also thinking about um, this a kind of methodological becoming. And I think it's really valuable, not for us to list our methods, but to think about how do we make knowledge? And I think that's what the handbook really communicates. Thank you, Naomi. I think, yeah, I mean, unless uh, uh, Mary Louise or, or, or Jenny or, or Derek wants to come back, please do just 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 speak and I will immediately mute myself. Um, yeah, Mary Louise. I would like to make one comment because I just in the direction we're going, um, going back to Charles or Derek's point that he was in this having this incredible discussion about language and bilingualism in a class in Italian. And I have felt for a very long time that there's a big hole in our university curricula that's the hole where there should be uh, the, the class on how to study language and how to think about language and how to think about lingualisms. And um, we instead, and that that should be a class that we give not out of Italian studies. We all have to work connected with some language, Spanish in my case, or Portuguese. And, and um, I think there's a big disciplinary problem when linguistics, the discipline of linguistics kind of took over the field of how to study language, how to think about language, and then narrowed itself down to extremely formalistic, you know, uh, Chomsky and grammatical models. And the field of sociolinguistics, and I'm talking now from the United States, of course, but the field of sociolinguistics was there, but as kind of a sidebar. And so the, there's not a space within what's modern languages. There's not a space for the course on how to think about language, how language operates in the world, that everybody majoring in a language ought to be in that course, you know, together. And so that what the kind of thing that Derek's doing in his class should be happening in a class where all the all the language majors are there together, thinking together and 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 learning how to think about language. And I do I just think it would be incredibly empowering to so many students to have that a, a thing in the, a, a curricular a subject area called language studies that's that's exactly has that mission. And um, it would be as important to English majors to take that as to anyone majoring in a, in a, in a second language. So anyhow, that's, it's just a, a feeling I've long had that there's this hole in the curriculum that has to do with linguistics having kind of monopolized the study of language and taken it away and the rest of us being slotted into individual language areas. So I would love to see this that get remedied somehow in your in your in your school. <laughs> well, Thanks. Well, thank you so much. That I mean, that, that's that's a, we can come back to, to to a whole series of points. Then I think I might invite Ed Welsh uh, at some stage to to talk to about subject benchmarking. But that's 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 there are, there are huge ideas there. Uh, Clorinda, do you want to come in? Yes. Hello, thank you very much for this. Uh, well, first of all, for the handbook and of course for this opportunity. And I just, I wanted to um, echo uh, what uh, Mary Louise was just saying that the way our departments are organized in the United States, I mean, the siloing of the languages themselves and the competition for enrollments means that we work against each other. Um, about 10 years ago, I succeeded in creating a course called the Intercomprehension of the Romance Languages. And if you know one Romance language, you can participate in this class. And um, in this class, I mean, we use a book called uh, Urom 5, where we work with five different Romance languages. And by the end of the class, the students um, through the, the methodologies of intercomprehension um, are able to read and translate across the Romance languages. And we read um, texts about, about language study and about multilingualism. And I'm thinking that that is a course where you know, we can, I can use the handbook because that's one of the problems. What kind of courses in the United States 
I feel like you almost need to create new courses um, so that we can we can we can do that. And I, I think it's really a call, you know, to arms from that point of view. It's really we really need to be able to overcome these stumbling blocks because what's happening is that all of the languages are losing ground because we're not able to break out of the silos. I just wanted to add one more thing, a, a course that I taught many, many years ago, and I'm thinking that would be the ideal course as well from within the um, 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 area of Italian. But I um, took texts that were um, uh, brought about multiple perspectives, texts that weren't very often, I don't think, read in, um, in the Italian classroom. And I'll cite one, and I can't even, the fact that I can't even remember the title of it, but it's Dacia Maraini, who created a questionnaire um, that she gave to Alberto Moravia and his sister about their childhood, asking them to, to answer questions about you know, their impressions of their childhood and the way that the, they had lived events in their families' lives that were completely different. My students were really blown away by this. Like, how could that same event in the family have been lived so differently? So I asked the students, that was their assignment, was to create that kind of a questionnaire and ask their own siblings and parents to answer the questions. And then they had to report on it in an Italian essay. It was one of the best things we ever did. And I'm thinking their essays from um, the handbook would have fit perfectly into that. They would have been, because we don't really have reading, but at that time we didn't have reading material to sort of go along with it. Anyway, I may try to teach that class again. Thank you. Thank you very much for that, Clarinda. I think this is these are hugely significant issues. I mean, what, we were talking about this uh, only yesterday at uh, at the uh, at the institute, and that is the way in which, in some respects, modern languages, in a sense, has a problem in that so many people either just really focus on language acquisition and reduce the the disciplinary field to that. Um, when, of course, languages cannot be abstracted from its whole um, cultural and social context. Um, and the other problem I think that we, we tend to face is that, um, as Naomi said, it is a complex uh, interconnected business to talk about the series of intersecting methodologies that are part of the disciplinary field. And you can't simply list them. Uh, and perhaps the way to do that is actually to... Um, to see their operation in a, in a context and allow um, people to gain a sense and an appropriation of those methodologies without telling them. And I think works like a handbook enable that, that process of, uh, of appropriate, creative appropriation to occur. Uh, it's a difficult message to get across uh, easily and simply, but I think that has to be a, a way in which we think um, uh, uh, think about that. Um, yeah, and, and, and of course, the, the other thing is that, I mean, so, language is so fundamental to everything, and yet so many disciplinary structures are quite indifferent to it. Um, so those, those are a couple of reflections on that. So we could continue on the, on the question of, of language, we could go back to the notion of ethnography. Charles Fawcett was going to say something. Uh, we could then talk a little bit. Um, yeah, I've got a raised hand. Okay, Geraldine, please go ahead. Yeah, hello. Uh, thank you very much. And thanks to everybody for their interventions so far and this really interesting book. And um, I really wanted to pick up on what Mary Louise said about having some kind of course or module or training for everybody learning different languages and um, and I just wanted to bring up that actually that's what we do in translation studies um, uh, which I teach at UCL so we will very often collect all of our students from whatever language that they're they're studying for translation purposes into a room and we'll teach them translation theory or I do a module on translating um, modern literary culture where I have all students of different languages in the room with me and thinking about that 
made me think about more about the connections between translation studies and language studies. And I'd be very interested to hear what um, other people who are here today think about whether where we can make more connections between these two disciplines. And it was very striking for me that there are three interventions in this handbook on translation. Uh, I don't know whether Laura Dana wants to come back on that. Um, and actually, I've got another question about the index for the editors, but perhaps we can squeeze that in a bit later on in the session. I'd be delighted to talk about translation of modern languages, but I think Jenny and Derek should talk about the the origins of those three essays and thinking about that multiplicity. But 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 yeah, I'm happy to talk about the 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 rethinking of translation and and those three essays are so much the the thing they have in common is that they are all about rethinking the notion and rethinking the the role of translation. But but Jenny and Derek should comment on. Uh, shall I go first, Jenny? Are you still there? Um, yeah, you go first. Uh, yeah, yeah, we had three, we've, we've got three essays on translation. And I do think while they've got commonalities, they've got differences. Um, I think the point I would want to make, though, and it goes back to uh, the point that um, Lisa Pamford had made about the inclusion of race as a separate category in. Uh, the volume, how we didn't do that, but how um, engagement with race, racial categorization, racial difference actually feeds into a number of well, nearly all of the essays in different ways. I think our feeling was that, um, well, my feeling is that we want to encourage readers to actually engage with translation, practice of translation, alternative, transla to, to, alternative to translation uh, throughout the book, because a lot of the chapters do mention translation in different ways and do different things with it. Uh, outside the discipline of translation studies that it's more formally constituted. And I think that kind of vernacular practice for us are, is, is important as well. Uh, so we want the diversity and, you know, the three S's do signal the importance of translation to our discipline and to our thinking. But we would also invite readers to actually look at translation from the, from the angles in which it's approached in a whole range of chapters across the volume and not kind of like settle on um, really it's kind of like formal articulation in those three instances. Jenny, I don't know if you want to say any more than um, No, I think that sums up how we approach this. All I'd recommend is looking at in the, the videos on the website, look at Clorinda Donato's or listen to her comment because she focuses very much on the, the transla translation um, contributions in really interesting ways that made me sort of rethink how they relate to each other as well. So um, just a plug for that. And, and if I can come back to Geraldine, and lovely to see you, Geraldine, but yeah, I think in translation studies, we've been very aware um, of the limitations of notions of translation, but also of the misunderstandings and misrepresentations of notions of translation, especially as Mary Louise Pratt was saying, in that narrow understanding of, of language learning that 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 at, at a certain point um, came to dominate. I have to say that again, I go back to that uh, wonderful, I'll be I'll be putting that forever, that combination that Mary Louise Pratt mentioned of joyousness and and, and you know joyous and just, just and joyous, those two um wonderful assonant words. Um, I think translation for me, has been precisely a way into rethinking what it is that we're doing in learning languages or in teaching languages and how that cannot be about assimilation, cannot be about the, aboli the, the abolition of, of diversity, for instance. It's the opposite. It's about the ability to move. So it's that that fluidity and that mobility that comes through languaging that is what mm -hmm. translation understood in this way can bring into the discussion of, of language learning. Um, but that also, and Clorinda again is, is, um, is, is so much of a trailblazer here, um, that has to come with a rethinking, for instance, of the whole mystique of target language, which can think of our own limitations. Translation studies to an extent continues to 
to support. So we have to be constantly also self-critical about the way in which we use those terminologies. One of the things that came through the project, the, the larger project from which the whole series and this sort of pivotal um, uh, volume uh, handbook come from, one of, one of the big results of that for me was, for instance, that I, I now systematically do not use, unless it is to critique them precisely, um, definitions such as native speaker and mother tongue. I, I, I understand their strategic nature, especially when it comes to mother tongue and, and minority or disappearing languages. Um, I, you know, I, I again, I'm, I'm happy to talk about their histories, but I don't want to work with those terms in, in, in the way in which we look towards the future. Thank you, Dorita. I think that that's a very important point about avoiding certain terminologies and also thinking about structural changes in the way in which language teaching occurs and the way in which we really do need to get beyond a distinction between language and cultural teaching in many ways. Um, Claire Ross has made a point in the, I wonder if Claire, if you want to talk to that in the, um, if Claire is here. In the chat Sorry, just to go <laughs> well for my yeah. video to turn on um i was just going to say that um you know our i work at the university of reading in england and we did used to have separate departments you know department of italian department of german uh, um, and quite a few years ago they did um, merge into a department of languages and cultures and we do offer for our what we call part one or freshman uh, students um a combined, uh, um, I guess you'd call it cross-listed uh, module for students called language skills. Uh, um, and it's about a kind of meta approach to learning, albeit probably Western European uh, languages. And um, I, I guess someone else spoke about, you know, departments being in competition with one another uh, um, for for students and, and and we're in a situation now where we're one department and and uh, funneling students towards uh, the, this cross-listed module that's all yes thank you claire i mean this raises i think an issue that's uh, all schools departments of modern languages actually face and that is the development of a specialist knowledge in a particular linguistic area, however broadly that is defined, and at the same time, a wish to develop a knowledge in much more global perspective. Uh, and that is something that I think we, every department um, struggles with, and the ways in which you, you can approach that are, are many, um, but it's, it's certainly one in which we can explore um, collective experiences of that. It is, it is a very um, complex issue to address in teaching. We could um, actually go to, I mean, Char yeah, Charles Forstick, who's been engaged many years in these issues. Do you want to come in here? You were going to make a point earlier. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'd, I'd very much like to come in, Charles, if that's okay. Um, and I just wanted to go for a couple of points. I think going back to ethnography is useful and, and the, the work that um, Naomi led on ethnography and modern languages a few years ago is I still think extremely important. But if I could just pick up on what, what Geraldine said about the, the intersection with translation. Um, we haven't talked much about the genesis of the broader project um, behind the handbook, but I think it's important to remember that it came from a um, cross-disciplinary program called Translating Cultures. Um, and Translating Cultures is a term first coined in, in anthropology um, in, in the 80s. So um, we're thinking about those anthropologies um, ethnographic anthropological origins there anyway. And with, with translating cultures, the, the Transnational Modern Languages Programme existed alongside other big projects on multilingualism and on translanguaging. And that the, they, they were part of a, uh, a broader infrastructure, I suppose, which, which was trying to say, look, translation and modern languages do not exist in the antithetical relationship um, which was perceived for a long time. Actually, that, that they are complementary. Translation is a key part of, of rethinking what um, modern languages is about. And what we tried to do with that program was, was to look at language studies, look at languages research, and reflect on its potential catalytic um, presence across a, a broad range of other disciplinary areas, particularly in the humanities, uh, the arts and humanities, um, but, but, but also um, beyond. And, and I think, 
the discussion so far has, has very much been in that spirit because transnational modern languages, the handbook, they, they are not a silver bullet. Um, they, they, they're part of a range of uh, solutions. And I, I think what, what um, I really enjoyed when Mary Louise, Mary, Mary Louise was talking was that sense that the handbook and the team of contributors did not do this work in isolation. Um, we had a whole series of interlocutors. Mary Louise um, was a very important interlocutor through her work um, for many of us. Um, I could also mention the Language Acts and World Making Project um, at, uh, at King's College London, which was part of the Open World Research Initiative, which is very much part of um, the, the, the spirit of, of this activity. And um, Mary Louise mentioned, others have picked up on this importance of um, a module around how to study languages, how to break down um, the perpetuation of monolingualism within individual language areas, my own included um, uh, French studies. And, and I, I, that strikes me as being absolutely essential, reflecting on language learning and um, cultural um, uh, analysis in the classroom and in the wild, but crucially at home as well as abroad. And um, what I really appreciated from the beginning of the discussion um, in Mary Louise's comments was that focus on teaching and citizenship. And I, I remember that many of you will, will have shared this. A couple of years ago, there was that tipping point when I realized that the majority of undergraduate students in front of me were born in the 21st century. Um, so that they, they were born digital, they were born transnational, and um, the, the world that I had experienced at their age was radically different from the one we were trying to, um, to, to prepare them for. And I think that's what excites me about, about the handbook. It's this idea, again, Mary Louise said this, concepts don't change the world. And that, that's crucial to, to the work of thinkers like, um, like, like Edouard Glissant. They make us, they help us to make sense of it, but we need to do something else. And what encourages me, and I see this amongst our undergraduates in Liverpool, I see it elsewhere, is we have got a generation of young people um, who are committed politically, committed um, socially, committed environmentally. They're willing to grapple with um, the major challenges of, of the 20, 21st century. They're willing to, to think about um, citizenship in ways that perhaps was not the case previously. We have an opportunity to say, um, your disciplinary identity is part of that reflection on citizenship. Um, the work that we do in, um, in learning languages and in studying cultures um, is precisely to do with the, the, those modes of linguistic sensitivity, that um, openness to questions of ethics linked to um, multilingualism, a transnational dexterity that a number of our students develop, and understanding transnationalism not as a neoliberal invention, but a, 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 as a, a potential alternative um, set um, of, of practices. So I, I think what excites me about the handbook is it's part of a broader set of challenges um, and activities, which I suppose ultimately are to do with something that a number of people on this screen have mentioned. That's the need um, in, elsewhere, that's the need to move from language advocacy to language um, activism, and to, to see how this sort of handbook can be um, a useful way of tooling our students and indeed ourselves and I, I think as well, um, broader publics um, to whom uh, we can engage in, in what Mary Louise called elsewhere, that, that, that public idea about language. Um, I, I think it's an opportunity to say, look, our subject areas are not in, um, in, in siege mode. They are not um, introverted, but actually they are crucial in their chronic extroversion um, to grappling with, with these challenges in the 21st century world. Thank you, Charles. I won't even say anything. I'll just leave it for people to come back on, on a number of the points that um, Charles uh, uh, has made. I think I'll bring Ed in here because Ed has been struggling with subject benchmarking. Do you want to respond to Charles's point and um, say a little bit about what you've been doing? Thank you, Charles. Um, I, I'll, I'll respond and I think kind of like bounce off it um, in, in, in hopefully kind of useful ways. I, I thought I'd start actually by thinking just in terms of the, the, how the handbook might be used. And it occurs to me that one of perhaps its most productive uses might be um, even before the classroom when we are presenting potential modern like linguists with the possibility of studying the subject at university because I looked at again at the 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 content pages just as we were talking, 
Uh, and the 37, just those 37 names, is actually such an invitation to explore um, a huge diversity of possibilities and topics and interests that you can cover as a modern linguist. And I think that diversity is really important in terms of signalling the strength of what it is that we do. I, I think what's also interesting about that 37 and about the diversity it represents, uh, you know, the excitement that that can, can represent for a student or a potential student, also brings us back to the point that Naomi made, which is which which resonated with me very strongly. Which is what are our methodologies, and and I, and I think that is one of the that that's one of the potential weaknesses of modern language. It's also a fundamental strength, and I really liked um, Charles's comment at the end about our chronic uh, our, our chronic extroversion, and I think that's really important in terms of what it is that we do as modern linguists, which which is that we're prepared to take the risk in uh, ranging widely across the subjects that we cover and in how we cover them as well. Um, I'll, always, I'll never forget a, a sort of a, a, an illumination moment, which was when I was, this sounds really boring and really administrative, but it was kind of a very kind of insightful moment. I, I, was, I was helping out with a, with a review of another department in, a, in, in the institution I was working for, one of those for teacher reviews. And it was history, I'll name it, it was history. And the historians just sort of sat there and said, yes, what we do is we train, we, we, we train good historians. And I was always really struck by that, that very clear sense of what they were and how they functioned as a discipline um, and, and a very kind of clear sense of understanding. And I, and I left that and thought, how do we talk about ourselves as modern linguists? Do we, do, what, what is it that we do? And the fact is that we do lots of things with our students. We train them in historical perspectives. We train them in theoretical perspectives. We train them to function interculturally and trans, uh, translinguistically as well. And that methodological variety um, and potential diffuseness, I think, is, is also for me a great strength. And I think that really kind of comes across in the way the, the handbook is set out. And I, I'd like to think that's also something we try to capture in the subject benchmark statement that's currently out for consultation. Plug, please respond by the 2nd of November if you're in the UK. Um, because what we did with that group was bring together 20 people from across the United Kingdom, all working in modern languages, but all working in different aspects of it and bringing different um, skills and backgrounds and, and competences to that conversation. And what really kind of came out of it for me was both the diversity of our approaches, but also that quite confident sense that we had that when we take our students, we're able to expose them to a whole different ways of thinking and hopefully give them that the tools that they need to be able to function across all these different uh, methodologies, these different conceptual areas, these different cultures and these different types of material they're working with. So, and it was really striking that the handbook and the kind of the subject benchmark statements have come out kind of more or less simultaneously because I think they speak to each other almost necessarily, almost without necessarily knowing that they were going to do. But I think that tells us something about how collectively at the moment we're understanding where modern languages is and, and that the great diversity that it encompasses, but also the coherence of that diversity without sounding trying to sound too paradoxical. Um, and yeah, so so I I, I think I think for, for for us it was for me it was very reassuring to see how you had conceptualised the field of modern languages in that term of its flexibility and the the possible connectedness, but also the fact that that it's it's not it's never a linear journey in modern languages. Modern language learning is not linear for one thing, but the possible routes you can take are not linear, and I think that's an exciting place for us to be, an exciting thing for us to encourage our students to embrace you know because it's a challenging thing to do uh, it's, a, it, it's it can be a scary thing to do but i think it's it's perhaps the thing that makes us one of the most rewarding humanities disciplines actually um I, i'll leave it there for now i mean i could embroider further on the subject benchmark statement in terms of the the agenda or the kind of the points you were making there but but i think maybe just for now i've sort of witted enough so we'll let a lot of the people kind of um come in not at all, Ed. That was, that was very, very focused and, and, and extremely topical. Would people like to? Yeah, Derek. Um, yeah, I think um, I'm, I must say I'm really enjoying this conversation, which is sparking off all sorts of ideas and going in different directions around what I think is a commonly shared purpose and understanding of everyone who's in this room. 
What I think I would really like to hear, though, is from uh, dissenting voices, people who don't share this kind of like transnational, translingual, fluid perspective, who don't share this kind of interest in mobility and transformation and uh, purpose and progress and real worldness that we have all been talking about in different ways. I think one of the challenges, and this goes back to um, Charles Forsdick's earlier point, talking about transnational cultures as a, as a project was precisely because there wasn't a great sense of purpose within modern languages, within language education, with under, in understanding of the importance of language, linguistic diversity across academia. And I think most of us talking to our colleagues in our home departments will recognise, will have to admit that a lot of our colleagues don't share the, our own vision, don't really see a handbook as something which is workable, which is useful, which is pertinent to their specific language disciplines. And I think it would be really fascinating for this conversation to actually hear from some of these voices. Sorry, Charles, you're looking slightly... No, I was just saying that. I feel it might be difficult in this particular circumstance, but that is a question to bring to bring out and bring and to see this the, the, the series of interventions as really addressing some of the questions and some of the people who are who would take a, a, a very different stance about the purpose of uh, what we do, or indeed the fact that perhaps uh, one shouldn't really focus too much on purpose. I think we have to. Um, but that is a question certainly to take out. I wonder if we might bring um, Liz Renault in uh, in this, who's, uh, who's been certainly talking about um, the transnational and um, developing methodologies for that, or indeed you know, to, to, to ask Mona, um, who, who's um, on the call, and, um, and, and talk about um, the uses for a postgraduate student of this volume. So, um, yeah, Liz and then Mona, if you can talk a little bit. Uh, yeah, just, let, let's run with this idea of opposition to this. Um, uh, yeah, um, so the context I'm coming from, I, I led a curriculum review in the School of Modern Languages in Cardiff University. We started in 2016, uh, 2016 we started. Loredana was um, a great ally, I think, when we were, we were doing this. And I think it'd be fair to say, Loredana, that it wasn't universally welcomed, was it? Um, it was, and what we were looking to do was to put the, you know, to really much, very much what you're trying to do, to put the transnational at the heart of it, to come out of language disciplines and to think about um, where do our languages fit with each other, with different communities. And, and there was opposition to it because it was the, the view was we are here to do French and that is what we're going to do, or we're here to do German. And, um, you know, I, I won't name the discipline, but one discipline did say to us very clearly, there is no transnational aspect to my subject discipline. And, um, and and that was something that was really strongly held beliefs at the time. And it was and it was tricky because we knew that there was this great set of books that were coming through. But of course, we were in 2016 and um, and they weren't there yet and they weren't going to be there. And I think if we had had something like this at the time, I think it would have been a much easier sell for us. Than it was to, for people to see to see the value because there was a really strong belief, um, particularly in in education. Students are coming from A level, and and what we're selling them, what we're selling their parents, is a study of a specific discipline. And I think and that that was a real and and you know I, I don't think those views have gone away entirely. I think um, for us having people like Jenny, people like um, Charles Fawcett come to the school to talk about this, that was really a game changer for us of having people explaining the rationale from outside the school about why this was important. But those, the, those views were there and, and, and it, it's, a, it's a battle, I think, in some quarters um, around, around hearts and minds. So yeah, it's, it's, if you want opposition, I think it's out there. It might not always be voiced, but it, it's certainly there. It, and, and yeah, Charles, if I can jump in there. Absolutely. I remember, you know, I remember some of the meetings and I remember some of the some of the reservations um, and, and, you know, and, and, and some are, particular, are perfectly legitimate um, people. We, we always work under the dictatorship of time, for instance. And so, you know, how do you enlarge the curriculum without losing some of the, um, the specificities and so on? So the, the perfectly legitimate concerns. All I would say, and, and I'm not saying this out of out of vanity in, in any in any way, but Liz was there. 
the very first time that we started one of these courses and was the course that was doing again in a partly different way the reflection wasn't entirely about language and language learning and, and languaging it was more about um the overall question of how do we approach languages and 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 the learning that goes with them in a way that it is that isn't anchored to the silos of the nation but we we did create list did that that all the work on that really on creating this um a, a course that would bring together all the students and it was literally i think the first lecture that the new intake of students however many there were 300 of them had um, and I was the person who walked into the room to do that lecture, and it's the only time in my life that I had an applause at the end of the lecture. So I think the answer, in a sense, that we then had to our colleagues is, yes, but this speaks to those students, to those millennial students that, that, that Charles Forsley was talking about. They connected, and we had some of the comments we had was, okay, I was even perhaps thinking, is modern language is what I want to do, I might change. But this speaks to me, speaks to my experience. So I'm going back to what I was saying earlier. It's making that connection with experiences that our students already have, but they are themselves struggling to find ways to, not to rationalize, that's the wrong word, but, but to really make sense, you know, and to make sense and to make knowledge out of that. And so I think that's what helps. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, if I can just come back, what Loredana isn't saying is somebody did actually cry at the end of that lecture because they were so overwhelmed as well. Um, good tears, not like bad tears. Um, um, and that, and it was incredibly successful. But I think if you want to send in voices as well, one of the things is that this is incredibly difficult to assess. And we have the students who really, really engage with the intellectual ideas as we're as we're going through it, but not all of them. And again, this will speak to different universities in, in, in different ways. Uh, and you can deliver these really interesting ideas. But the question always seems to come back to how do you assess it? And and the and and then if, if you're not assessing something, because we went in with the kind of the very um utopian idea, this is something that's good to learn, this is something that will be that's enriching, that's engaged, that's important. But we had a part of the student body that came back to, well, if you're not assessing it, I'm not going to engage with it. And so that is, I think, when you put trans, when you try to manage transnationalism that sits outside of the language discipline, that is across school, across um, across different subject areas, I think it's an incredibly valuable thing to do, but we still haven't found that answer of how do you assess it and who assesses it? Because does this sit with the language program or does it sit with the people who are delivering the transnational ideas and how do you assess it? And how do you assess it rigorously and fairly? And, and that's something that we, we haven't found the answer to, I'm afraid. I'm going to ask Mona to come in, if you don't mind, Mona, just from a perspective of a postgraduate student and thinking about undergraduate experience. And then I'm going to ask Mary Louise uh, to talk a little bit about opposition to the kind of um, direction of travel and purpose um, for, from your own experience. But, but first Mona and then perhaps uh, Mary Louise. Um, I think my undergraduate experience really put me into direction of trying to transnationalize my research. I was trained as in English literature and language in a uh, university abroad and what i realized was that um in researching or understanding literatures that are not really close to my cultural heritage it made me understand the significance of my own culture uh, beyond the linguistic um, areas and i think it's really important that now we have an, a community like charles said that are digitally born and some of them are born beyond their cultural borders. I mean, we have a huge Arab community in the UK, for example, who don't speak Arabic, but they understand the significance of Arab culture and they would like to um, study that and engage in conversations uh, that deals with Arab culture in their specific linguistic area that they can um, negotiate with. But I think the way that some departments are more language specific linguistically, they, they don't invite that community, the community in the middle to the conversation, which then makes it a lot more, um, in my perspective, quite flat. Um, so yeah, that's been my kind of experience. Thank you. I think we can certainly identify very strongly with that. I don't want to come back on some of the points that Liz, uh, Mona have made. Um, I think 
So, yep, absolutely. Mary Louise. I was just, uh, just since you invited me to chime in, yeah, I do think that um, for a lot of us, well, and I'm speaking generation, generationally, but uh, one of the big ambiguities is around the status of what you might call literary competence, right, in our, in our language majors. Um, and uh, it's very, you know, it, it's very disconcerting, for example, in my case, to speak to, um, say, a group of PhD students in Spanish and uh, who are working either in Latin America or in Spain, and none of them, they're doctoral students, and none of them knows anything about the 19th century. And I am so aware, of course, of how important that is to understanding the 20th and 21st centuries and the whole formation of, of national cultures, for example, in Latin America after independence from Spain, the whole trajectory of trying to find, figure out what republicanism should, is and uh, how that affects, how that ends you up with the dictatorships of the 70s and you know the constitutional crisis in Chile today. That trajectory is so, plain to me and the, the literary signposts all the way along. And so, yeah, I think that that's something we, our conversation, we haven't, in, at least in my institutional experience, we haven't had good conversations about how, you know, literary competence got decentered and what that, what the consequences of that are. And at the same time, we can see that the teaching of literature is has it also revitalizes itself all the time, and the kind of work we do with transnational things revitalizes literary studies. So someone could say the language I work in has no transnational dimension, but if it has a medieval component, it has a it has a huge dimension, continental dimension, and if um, and you will have if it is as national as it may be, there are points at which it is inhabited by other languages. And so there's a, there, those are perspectives. I just keep remembering the way that, you know, the English language literary canon was totally revitalized, not displaced, but revitalized by feminism. And suddenly there was more Shakespeare. We found this out in the Modern Language Association. There was, when feminist methodologies came in, there was more Shakespeare being taught than before because it was all, you could reread everything, you know? So that revitalizing in the area of literary studies ha goes on, has to go on. And th that can be part of the negotiation between literary studies and cultural studies. But I think we haven't, we've, we're still in such an experimental phase with these, this, these shifts that we haven't figured out what the status of literary competence is and where we wanna put it. And a lot of us have it and our students don't, you know, and our advanced students don't. So I, I think that's one issue. I just wanted to add one other small thing, which is, you know, the, tra the translation is, is such a, a huge and valuable and rich field for talking about transnationalism. But there's also um, the, the field where about um, that doesn't involve translation, that it's about migrancy. So what I'm thinking about is exa an example like global hip hop, where you have this, there's now no language in the world that does not have hip hop in that language, which is astounding. It's astounding because hip hop, you know, was a, it's a verse genre with a very particular four foot line. I hear some metrics you know, and, and a whole use of rhyme that was born out of a certain, you know, English located in a certain geography in the U.S. and um, a certain kind of English. I mean, it's mainly African-American English, but with a lot of Puerto Rican English and Dominican English in it. And that form has, has hip-hopped literally into every language, every language in the world now hosts hosts that form. And this thing about one language hosting another or hosting a form that that literally is has the phonology of another, to me is extremely interesting. And when I've taught, you, you, it's been very fascinating in classes to teach 
put up, you know, classic U.S. hip hop and then bring in Japanese hip hop and Haitian hip hop and, and um, Nigerian hip hop in Yoruba or in Igbo, you know, and, and uh, try to figure out how people adapt their, how the, the performers adapt the, like the rhythmic structure and the phonology of their language to make the template work. Um, it's, it's another very, very interesting thing about linguistic migrancy that it's not about translation, but something completely other to that. So it, that's just another dimension of this problem that I find very fascinating. Yeah, totally. I mean, I think that's, that's an extremely um, a good example of, 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 of a, a cultural movement that is uh, that for, for which one needs a global perspective. Um, I wonder also, just to come back on, on so many of these issues, the, the question about, um, sorry, there's a question here, I'm smiling. Yeah, okay, yes. Um, yeah, uh, Laura Dana adding to that in, in the chat, the question of, yeah, purpose, revitalization, um, thinking about some of the complexities of these issues, and also trying to, um, certainly create the community in the subject uh, subject area, but also actually how do you get that message across uh, when it is a very complex message? And I think that's something that we do um, um, struggle with. I mean, this is what, uh, certainly what um, Charles Fawcett was saying, and I think it was picked up by Ed Welsh, is, is there is, a, to a degree, a problem in communicating this, uh, the complexity of what we do um, beyond the subject area, even within the subject area. So that's something that we might think about. And then the, the question that was raised about how from this kind of um, disciplinary configuration, can you move outwards to talk about um, citizen uh, citizenship, societal impact, uh, understanding of the way in which uh, the disciplinary area and the work, the research that is done within it has obvious policy implications. So perhaps we can reflect a little bit on, on that. Or perhaps that is, yeah, no, Joe, thank you. Hi, John. Hi, thanks. Uh, yeah, so I, I, I guess I have a question which which I think is relevant to, um, to to a handbook, but also to what you're saying about policy and particularly the way in which the the series of books is moving the direction in which the wider transnationalizing modern languages series is moving. So I know that this series of books, uh, which the handbook is related to, were initially conceived within language areas around German studies, French studies, uh, Russian studies. But I also know that the, the series is now expanding uh, thematically and beyond those uh, linguistic uh, and kind of national uh, containers. So my question, I guess, is, is for the editors of the series, is for anyone who's been involved with the series, about um, how it relates to that broader set of books within the Transnationalizing Modern Languages series and whether a handbook has changed the direction of that series or it seems it has uh, in, in, in my view in, 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 from what I see. So I'd just be really interested to hear a bit more about that, the wider series and the direction about it, uh, the direction of that series. Yeah, thanks Joe, I'm sure, yes, I we can talk about that without any, yeah. But the first question, we'll end with your last question, which is, has the uh, the handbook changed the direction of the series? And I think that's one for Derek and Jenny um, to start with, and then we can possibly talk about the direction of the series and uh, how, it's, how it's moving. So Derek or Jenny, I mean. Um, I don't know if a handbook has changed the direction. I think from a broader perspective, uh, the first swathe of books, including a handbook, were con sort of conceptualised more or less at the same time. Jenny and I maybe took a bit longer um, to bring the handbook to publication because of the, the, the number of essays and 
the way in, in which we'd chosen to work. I don't know, I'd be really interested to hear from the editors of the national volumes, how they now feel about how their how the national volumes sit with a handbook available because you'd always say that the national volumes could be or should be used in conjunction with the handbook but again we kind of like maybe stumble over the practical question about how that will actually be realized um i think we'd always too thought that the national transnational part of the series was really a convenience based on the state of the discipline now that it made more sense, that made the volumes more intelligible to how languages were actually delivered, at least in the UK. You know, if you were in Italian or if you were in Spanish, there was something about the Italian transnational which made immediate sense and which made the book usable. Uh, we did have conversations about being immediately more ambitious and just being transnational rather than nationally transnational. But I think we were right uh, to heed the more cautious voices and build the project, which is very much an ongoing project. And Charles, you might want to talk a bit about the forthcoming volumes and how they've been conceptualized as well, um, to make this a, a, a kind of like organic project, a project which is both perhaps taking a lead in the discipline, but is also emerging from the discipline, which is expressive of the discipline as it's currently constituted, but certainly with an uncertain sense of futurity in mind. Thank you, uh, Derek. I can, I can certainly come back to that in a second. Um, I'm just, uh, Mary Louise is, is going to have to go in, in a few minutes and uh, uh, and that's absolutely fine, of course, uh, Mary Louise. And, and before you go, I'd just like to thank, thank you so much for all your interventions. Um, it's been very powerful and we're, we're great that we're going to have a recording of this conversation that we can, we can use and refer to. Um, so we, yeah, we could say a little bit more about the the series. I mean, I've, before I, I and I'll say a few words about that. But um, would anyone else like to to come in here? Um, Charles, you might want to say something since your volume is about to appear, and it will appear after the handbook. So. Okay, Charles. I, yeah, I, I'll I'll say something briefly because I, I can see, but um, but Barbara um wants to to come in as well. But so the um for various reasons the um the the, the French volume is coming. It will be published uh, later than anticipated. It's coming out next uh, next June. Um, and I'm pleased with that because it it it, it, it gives a sense that um that the traditional hierarchies within modern languages are being being disrupted and uh, um and i'm um, in some ways sort of uh, um turning the delays on our part in, 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 into something more positive but we we, we had the advantage of um working on and, and finishing the french volume alongside derek and and jenny's work on on the handbook and we're able to think about how the two um might fun function together and they function together in a in, in, in a not surprisingly um, complementary way, in, um, in that um, the as with the other volumes focused on individual languages, or what interests me is the way the series is going to go beyond um, individual languages, um, is we're trying to sort of prize open, transnationalize our understanding of, of France, of French, um, and of, of, uh, of, uh, of French cultures. Um, and make it clear that actually yeah, there is it's no surprise to anybody here, but um, within a, a Francophone context, there is no such thing as monolingualism. Um, e even in France itself, despite the um, linguophobia associated with um, Republican universalism and the, 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 the failure often to, to recognize the other languages of France, whether they're um, indigenous like Breton or whether they're, um, they're, they're more recently introduced languages like, um, like Arabic. Um, notwithstanding that, France is a fundamentally multilingual country. Um, French is nearly always operating in, in, in at least diagnostic situations. And so for us, the, 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 the um, transnational French volume needs to be read in relation 
to, to the handbook, which is part of this active prizing open. Um, and we will be, I'll be using the French book with, with students in, um, in Liverpool, we'll be using it across several courses and, and we'll, be, we'll be making sure that the students will read um, the, the transnational French volume alongside um, the handbook and, and so that the handbook can, can exist in the way some people spoke about it earlier as a, sort of, um, a set of tools um, for reflect, reflecting more broadly how an area like French and Francophone studies um, has got to be um, taught within more globalised frames, which go beyond the nation state. Thank you, Charles. Barbara, would you like to, I see your hands raised? Yes, yes. I don't know. Yeah, okay, now you can see me. Um, um, I'm talking about, you know, I would like to get back to Derek's point about resistance and uh, rejection, <laughs> because um, just taking, bringing my experience of, you know, I've been a PDRA in the TML project and in translating cultures. So I, I think I've been extremely lucky to be exposed to all these ideas and very ambitious perspective of changing modern languages. Um, you know, as, my, as a very formative, you know, experience that definitely shaped, you know, what, what I am, my approach to languages, which, by the way, was not my uh, back, academic background um, as well. So, you know, I came from this uh, fantastic experience and then I was appointed in Liverpool and I had to translate this <laughs> somehow into the experience of teaching. And uh, I have encountered, and I'm still encountering that kind of resistance that Derek was trying to, to explore earlier on, not only in, in colleagues, but also in students. So this is an issue that um, is definitely there and that we should be prepared to, you know, to engage with. And I think that as much as it is important to have um, ambitious perspective and uh, um, vision, because those are essential, uh, you know, kind of vision of structural changes. So, you know, in an ideal world, we would all have foundational transnational modules in our department in which we could use this fantastic teaching material, but we need to get there. And I think that we should also value the fact that we can go there through micro experiences that can be very valuable. And I think that this is precisely what the handbook will add to the book series, because I think that, for example, I plan to use it across the content and language modules, but I plan to use it, especially this year with my finalist, because I've got you know, some students that are writing their dissertations and with whom I can have like closer conversations. And that's where some of the chapters can be used and really influence a student that is interested, wants to engage and might be you know, evolving a postgraduate. So I think in the next couple of years, now that the book series will be published and the handbook will start to be used, we will have, you know, a space for experimentation um, at many levels. And I'm very positive and excited about it. And uh, I think it would be good to have a forum, maybe also to exchange all of this experience. And probably it's great. I mean, it's great also how you have already started to do that with the videos that some colleagues have shared ahead of, of this event to, to talk about some of the chapters and how they can be used uh, in teaching. So that's it, I'll leave it here, thanks. Well, thank, thank you very much for that reflection, Barbara. I think, I think that is, is very much you know, the kind of journey which um, certainly we, anyone involved in the, the, the series, and there are a lot of people involved in the series, is on. And I think just to, to, to talk a little bit about the, the idea initially was certainly to try to get beyond a very national centered um, uh, disciplinary community. Um, and to think certainly about the way in which you can talk more in a global frame while not neglecting um, the importance of the way in which the nation functions, both in the operation and the imaginary of people. Um, but I think, uh, as Derek said, the idea of it was probably the right thing to be uh, cautious and understanding at least the framework as it operates that there is 
there, there are subject associations, there are disciplinary communities, there are uh, uh, GCSE, A-level qualifications that you need to sort of, uh, certainly talking about the, the, the British context, that you, that you need to sort of be aware of and that you're not going to break down. So it is probably better to take a, at least you know, back in the day, and we are talking about years ago now, to take a slightly more cautious approach um, because you want this to be to play a role rather than simply being overly ambitious and then being discarded. I think that was that was the imperative that we, that we faced. But the the idea was always that it would be an evolving, changing, moving series. That it would be one contribution that would lead to others, and that um, that it would certainly um, make a, a, a an intervention in terms of bringing research and teaching more powerfully together. Um, so the volumes that uh, will appear. Uh, there's uh, volumes being prepared on Arabic um, transnational studies, on um, East Asian um, studies, uh, on transnational black studies, um, on environmental humanities. I think that the series will evolve and, and it will move in over, hopefully over years, but very much as a contribution to a confident, forward-looking, future-directed um, a, a porous, but at the same time coherent subject area. I think that that has been the plan, and it is it, it is good to see it evolving and changing as we do move through time. I think we're ten minutes. Be, we, we we always said we were going to finish five minutes before time. I think what we could do is just invite uh, any last questions, uh, and if there are none, we we could ask. Um, Derek and Jenny, just to conclude with a few words about where we are. So, yeah, Derek, Jenny, do you want to conclude the session? I would just like to conclude, Charles, by thanking everyone. Uh, thanking Mary Louise, who's just left us, thanking you and Kathy and everyone from what used to be called the IMLR for facilitating this conversation. Thank everyone who has made a video, who made a short video contribution, which we posted on uh, a handbooks web space, which I think in itself initiated a lot of thinking, a lot of very constructive thinking from a diversity of perspectives and allowed Jenny and myself to kind of enter a conversation which um, had already started without us in some respects, but which we were able to really draw on and uh, gain new perspectives on a handbook itself. We'd like to thank all the contributors and really thank everyone who's attended today for the generosity in contributing to this conversation, for the openness of perspective and for the innovative nature, the innovative set of questions they've actually brought to, to bear. And I think we would both look forward to um, everyone who's been involved in this conversation to adding to the website through more short video uh, interviews, conversations, or short interventions in, in written form to ensure that a handbook actually does have a future and will evolve and take us into new and we would hope unexpected directions. So just really to say thank everyone uh, today for, for taking part in this. Thank you very thank much. Thank you. Jenny. I'll just, yeah, I'll just echo all those thanks. I won't prolong this any further, but um, yeah, thank you to all those people who've contributed in various ways. And just to say that today, again, um, Derek's already said that um, the videos started to bring new perspectives and new ideas um, in response to the book that we perhaps hadn't thought of before and then Mary Louise's comments today and everybody else's comments and questions have brought still new perspectives which is really valuable for us but also a nice sort of demonstration of how they how a handbook sparks conversations and ideas so thank you to everybody and I look forward to working with everybody more in various ways thanks absolutely thank you so much this is a, a terrific publication and it's great to be able to have the, um, the generosity, as you've said, you've Derek has said, uh, of the conversation, the points that people have made. And the this is part of the conversation. It's great to have the recording. We will place that recording. It's uh, it, it's part of an evolving, moving discussion, uh, and uh, uh, which people can dip into 
and along with the videos, talk about the book and talk about their experiences uh, in part of a much wider disciplinary, a much wider societal context. So thank you, um, very warm thank you to everyone who made this possible and for everyone for being here and for talking. So we'll see you again soon. Thanks, bye.